Well, good morning. Good to see you this morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and take them out and turn to the book of Genesis. Uh, Genesis, the very first book in the Bible, so not, not a difficult one to find. Genesis chapter 16 uh, is where we're going to be today. Uh, as you're looking for that, I was thinking this week, uh, I've developed this kind of bad habit uh, in that anytime I'm just kind of standing around, like waiting in line at a coffee shop or just not active in some way, uh, I get on my phone and I look at social media. Anybody else do that? Is it just me? Right, it's just like, I, I just, and I don't really, it's not anything big. I'm just like scrolling through just kind of mindless stuff. There are some good things about social media. You get to see when, you know, someone's kid graduated from school or someone got married or it's somebody's birthday. Those are all, all good things. But most of the time, it's just kind of mindless and I'm looking at pictures and most of the pictures that you see and the things that we post uh, on social media are not our worst days. Like very seldom do you put, you know, on your, on your Instagram, or your Facebook or Twitter or whatever, like, uh, today I had a really bad day, here's a picture. It's like this facade that we create of our, our life and our vacations and our marriage and our kids and our daily life that we post so everybody else will look at our stuff and be like, their life is so great. My life is not that good. I wish my life was like that. The reality is their life is not like that either. It's this facade that has been created to, to basically display our best times. And I think sometimes as we think about the Bible, we think about the Bible kind of like uh, social media posting, that the Bible is this book full of good people. The reality is if you've read the Bible, it's not a book full of good people. It's a book actually full of bad people, but a good God. And one of the things I love about the Bible and I love about scripture is the Bible is the most honest book that there is. Because instead of always painting everyone is perfect, the Bible will pull the curtain aside and let us see behind stage some people's bad days and some of their worst days. And what we realize is we have a faithful God that even when we fall short, God uh, is faithful. And so one of the things that I want us to think about when we walk through the book of Genesis, it's the oldest book that we have, first book in the Bible. Uh, it's creation, the fall, sin, the flood. We're in Abraham, kind of his life. Uh, and the, the book of Genesis is timeless and it's timely. Uh, one of the things I've loved as I've studied Genesis, that we've dug into D Genesis, it's the most relevant book. Like the things that we see aren't just what happened but what always happens, the same things that they dealt with, the same struggles that they have, the same crisis that they walk through, we deal with as well. So the, the key thought that I want us to kind of bury in our minds as we look at this passage today is this idea that God is faithful even when we're faithless. That God is faithful even when our faith struggles. So we're gonna pick up in Genesis chapter 16 starting in verse one. Let's read it together. Now Sarai... Sarah, Abram's wife, was born, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. Now, let me just stop right there. A couple of things. How many of y'all think this is a good idea? Like nobody. Like nobody. Two wives is one too many. And basically, this is not a good plan. And what we're gonna see is Abram goes along with it. It doesn't work out well for him uh, in that. So it says, Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, gave her to Abram, her husband, as wife. And he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarah said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with content. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarah, behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. And Sarah dealt harshly with her and she fled from her. So what I want us to do is we kind of walk through this, uh, this story is look at each of the people that play a part in the story. 
Because what happens when you read the Bible, you can look at people, you can look at their flaws and the crisis and decisions they make. And what can happen uh, is you can either judge them or if you're honest, you can identify with them. You can look at people's lives and go, I've made that mistake too. I've made that decision too. I've walked down that path uh, as well. And so let's just kind of look at these, these characters in the story, the people in this story. What we're gonna see is that Sarah and Abraham here, Abram, had an imperfect faith. Now, Sarah, as we look at her, she had an impatient faith. Anybody here impatient? This is yes. Only three of you, really, that's really good. Okay, now you're being honest, that's good. Most of us are impatient. Like, I'm the kind of person that a microwave is not fast enough. We need to come out with something new, something that's a little bit faster than the microwave. That 30 seconds is too long, right? We have, we're impatient, and what happens often is not only we're impatient uh, with our lives, we have impatient faith. There, there are things that we believe God has told us or God has called us to, and instead of waiting on God, we get impatient and we get out in front of God. If you think back to, to last week in Genesis chapter 15, when God came to Abraham in a vision and he said, do not be afraid, I am your shield. The purpose of the shield, the protection that God gives is when we're behind the shield. And what happens when we get impatient, we get in front of the shield and guess what? There's no protection. We take all the arrows. And so what happens here is, is Sarah is impatient. And, and what happens is she, she begins to embrace her plans and not God's plans. Now, here's what's important to know and to think about in this account. Sarah did the right thing the wrong way. She knew the promise that God had given Abraham. You're gonna have a son. You're gonna be the father of a great nation. You're gonna have many offspring. So she knew the promise, she trusted the promise, she thought she was doing the right thing, she just did it the wrong way. Don't we all do that sometimes? We think we're doing the, the right thing, but we do it the wrong way. And she's impatient, her plans are not God's plans. And, and this all kind of stems back to the fact that, that Sarah's in a crisis. The crisis is Sarah is barren, she can't have kids. And what happens, and this is what happens many times in our lives, we take on whatever our, our struggle is or our trial or our sin, and we make that our persona. Instead of it just being something we're going through, we make it our identity. And so in her mind, she took on barrenness as her identity. I am barren. And because of that, she took things into her own hands. Now, in this culture, not having children was more significant than in our culture. I realize we have lots of couples that, that, that struggle with infertility. My wife and I did for a long time. I understand what, what you're going through, if that's your struggle. But in this culture, having children, providing children was everything. And Sarah had no kids. And so her identity in her mind became, I am barren. We also see here that she discounted the power of God. There's no evidence that Sarah went to God and was praying and seeking God and asking God to provide. What we see is she just took matters into her own hands. So here, here's my question for you. When you have a big decision, when there's something you feel like God is calling you to do, do you pray about it? Do you take it to God? Do you seek his timing? Do you seek his will? One of the things that I'm trying to teach my boys, I have a senior in college, he's kind of trying to figure out the rest of his life. I have a senior in high school, he's trying to figure out college uh, and really you know, what to eat for lunch. That's about where a senior boy is right at this point. But one of the things that I'm trying to encourage them is, is hey, as you think about these things, these big life altering decisions, are you going to God with them? Josh, are you praying about where you're supposed to go to college? Caleb, are you praying about future spouse? Are you praying for graduate school or what your, your next step is? Are you seeking the Lord? Both are, are young men of faith. They believe in God. They trusted in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They wanna please him. But are they going to him with their situations and their crisis and their opportunities and saying, God, what is your plan 
and will. I wanna be obedient to you. And there's no evidence that Sarah was doing that. She discounted the power of God, that God, who she had seen miraculous things done already, could come through and give her the child that God had promised. She also, and this is, this is super important, write this one down, she embraced what was okay in the eyes of the culture, but not okay with God. In the culture of Mesopotamia, this part of the world in this time, it was socially and morally acceptable if your wife couldn't have a child to take on another wife or to take on a surrogate and have another child with and through them. That was not immoral. That was accepted in this culture, but it wasn't with God. Go back to God's original creation, God's original intent. He made Adam, and then who'd he make? Eve. How many options did Adam have? One. That's how God set it up. One man, one woman, covenant before God forever. That's how God designed things to be. And so what happens is she, she embraces the culture and what was okay in the eyes of the culture. And you think about it, we're doing the same thing. So often in the church, when you think about the truth of God's word and what God says and what God teaches and what we learn from God's precepts, that God has a specific truth and it is truth. It is not bendable. We don't change it with the times and how culture changes. And so often, even within the church, we see denomination after denomination after denomination do this very thing in that they begin to compromise the truth of God's word for the culture. And the whole point of truth is its truth. It is absolute. And when you look at scripture, the Bible doesn't say church followers of my son, Jesus Christ, you need to conform to the culture. What the Bible says is we're called to be holy. And you know what it means to be holy? It means to be set apart. It means to be different than the world around us. That, that's why as Christians, we do sex differently. We do family differently. We do gender differently. We do sexuality different from the world based on what we see in God's word. So we don't bend our beliefs based on what the culture says. We stick with the truth. And that's exactly what happened here. She bent her beliefs, God's plan, God's will, based on what culture said was acceptable. And then she whines a little bit. <laughs> she's kind of figuring out her situation. She's upset about her situation. She's selfish. I, I went back in this passage, verses one through six, and I just circled every time she talked about herself. And she says, I, I, me, 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 my, my. What does that say? Man, that was impressive, wasn't it? Do that a hundred times, Right? It was all about her. So there was this selfishness. There was this bitterness that began to build in her. I don't have a kid. And then what? Blame. Whose fault is this? This is God's fault. God won't give me a kid. Abram, God won't give me a kid. She's bitter. She's selfish. She's upset. She blames God. What does she say? The Lord has prevented me. This is his fault. She became the victim. We live in a world that that's what everybody wants to be. Nobody wants to look at our circumstances or our situation and maybe say, you know what? God is causing me to wait because he's preparing me. Or this happened to me or that happened to me. Instead of looking at the situation, sometimes taking responsibility, what do we all want to be? We all want to be a victim. Let's blame somebody. Else. This is somebody else's fault. And that's exactly what Sarah is doing here. So she had impatient faith, she discounted the power of God, she embraced the culture, she blamed God, and there's kind of an ironic reversal here. As you look at the story, Abram, several chapters back, gave Sarah to Egypt, and now Sarah is gonna give Egypt to Abram here uh, through Hagar. So you got Sarah, then you have Abram. Now Abram is... Uh, one of the most significant men in the Bible, Old or New Testament. He's mentioned over 300 times. He's called the man of faith in the hall of faith in Hebrews. He has the most ink. Like he's the guy. Most people would be Abraham is, is big time on the Mount Rushmore of faith. He's on it. And so in this situation, you would think that when Sarah comes up with this crazy plan, that, that Abram be like, no, baby. 
That's not what we're doing. But what does he do? He goes along with it. Whatever. Okay, sure. Like, just craziness. How many think that's a bad idea? <laughs> yeah, everybody, especially all the women are like, yeah, yeah, it's a bad idea. I'm just telling you right now. It is, right? He's supposed to be the man of faith, but what is Abram? Abram commits the chief sin that males commit, and it's the sin of passivity. He just kind of stands back, whatever, baby. This started with Adam in the garden when, when the evil one, when Satan came to tempt Eve. Where's Adam during this conversation? Standing right beside her, just listening. At any point, he's gonna be like, hey, baby, we ain't listening to the snake. That's not how things work. But he just stands there. He takes the fruit. He takes the bite. We're suffering the repercussions of his sin. To this day, we live in a fallen world, and Abram is doing the exact same thing. Passivity is the chief sin of men. Instead of leading our wives and our kids and loving our wives and kids and serving our wives and kids, we passively step back and just allow things to happen. Most of the time, men, we step back and we allow our wives just to do everything. You lead our family spiritually. You get us up to go to church. You pray. You make the big decisions. And that's not how God designed things to be. He's called men to love and lead and serve our families. And what's interesting here, and this seems to be true with, with a lot of men as well, Abram is only passive with his wife and kids. The other areas of his life, he seems to take initiative. I mean, when Lot was kidnapped a couple of chapters ago and taken off into a foreign land, as soon as Abraham finds out about it, what does he do? He gets his mighty men and he goes and fights. Like, doesn't even think about it. Takes initiative, goes out there. He, he gets it done. But when it comes to his family, when it comes to his wife, he's passive. Abram is responsible for what's happening in this passage. He just experienced in chapter 15, just a little bit ago, the promise of God called coming to him in a vision and saying, fear not, I am your shield. I'm gonna make you a great nation. Your descendants are more than the stars. And how does that whole little section end? Abram believed and God counted it to him as righteousness. He believed, he had, he had faith. But then we get in this situation, he's just passive, he just stands back, he's just like, whatever, Sarah, that's, that's good. If that's the plan, we'll just go with the plan. Abram should have been the man to lead his family. And let me just encourage you men. This is the chief sin that we suffer from as men, passivity. God calls us not to lord over our wives, not to rule over our families, but to love them, to serve them, and lead them, and let me just give you a little hint, whether they ever say it out loud or not, the sexiest thing you can do for your wife is to lead your family spiritually. So we need to step up in those areas as men. Now, yeah, thanks. So the main problem, all this began when people of faith began to distrust God's word. They knew the promises of God. God had come to them and shared with them exactly what his plan was, and they didn't believe, it was disobedient. So we have a transition that takes place. You have this first conversation with Sarah and Abram, and now you have Hagar. Hagar is being treated unfairly. She flees, and we pick up in verse seven. It says, the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servants of Sarah, where have you come from? Where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from my mistress, Sarah. The angel of the Lord said to her, return your mistress and submit to her. And the angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that you cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you're pregnant. You're going to bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called on the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God of seeing. For she said, truly, here I've been he, with him, seeing him who looks after me. Therefore, the well uh, where she was, and we don't know how to say that word good, beer something, 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 right? It lies between Kadesh and Bered. 
That's how you say it in the Hebrew, by the way. And Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abraham. So again, kind of the second part of the story. First of all, we see Hagar. Hagar is uh, an Egyptian servant. So you go back in the story several chapters back when Abram took his, his whole crew, his family, his belongings, his wife to Egypt. When they fled Egypt after the Pharaoh kicked them out because Abram had given his wife Sarah to, to, to the Pharaoh. Long story, go back and read it. He sent all kinds of, of servants and slaves and riches and animals with him. So Hagar probably came from Egypt with Abram and Sarah. Now, there is no evidence that we see in Scripture that Hagar was a believer, that she had faith, that she had trusted in God. Uh, she was kind of, honestly, kind of innocent in the situation. I'm a servant. They're telling me I need to bear my master's kid. I don't know how much choice she actually had in the situation, but, but there's no evidence that she's a believer. Abram and Sarah never even referred to her by name. I mean, talk about feeling insignificant as a human being. You won't even say my name. You just call me the servant. So she feels unseen. And I think sometimes all of us can relate to that in our lives, that we feel unseen, that, that everything's going on around us. It's like, does the world not notice that I'm here? And so I'm sure she has that feeling of, of being unseen. It says, the angel of the Lord. Now, other parts of the Old Testament, what you see is an angel of the Lord, the heavenly host, a messenger. This differentiates between that, not an angel, it is the angel of the Lord. I believe when we see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, that it's what's called a Christophany, that it is an appearance of Jesus before his birth to Mary in the New Testament. So I believe that this is Jesus that has come to Hagar here. Uh, he comes to her, he seeks her out. She's the only person in scripture that names God. Every place else, God shares his name. We're gonna see next week, he says that he's El Shaddai. This one situation, this one circumstance, this one interaction between a non-believing woman and the angel of the Lord, she names God, she gives him a name, El Roy, which means the God who sees me. And the angel of the Lord tells her, you're going, you're pregnant, you're going to have a son. And the angel of the Lord sends her back to Sarah. Now, you may look at that and you may think, why would he do that? Like, she's being mistreated, why would God send her back? One, because God has a plan. Two, I believe, for her own protection. You have a, a single pregnant woman out in the wilderness on her way back to Egypt. And I think the angel of the Lord's like, the safest place for you to be is back with Abraham because I have a plan for you. So we have Agar, Hagar, and then we have Ishmael. Ishmael was born to Abram when Abram was 86 years old. His name means God hears. Ishmael had 12 sons. Uh, you think about that. There are 12 tribes of Israel through Isaac, then Jacob. And so anytime, anything in scripture that God creates, Satan counterfeits. Ishmael is the father of the Arabs. Ishmael was described, and this is a comfort as a mom, I'm sure, if God came to you and said, you're gonna have a son, and he's gonna be like a wild donkey. <laughs> like, that's not encouraging before the birth, that already you're telling me what my son's gonna be like. Now, I don't know a lot about wild donkeys. I know that Eddie Murphy was the voice of a donkey in Shrek. That's about all I know uh, about donkeys. And so looked up a little bit on donkeys, uh, wild donkeys, and wild donkeys are short, uh, stubby, strong, muscular, powerful, mean, ornery animals. Uh, think like a zebra. Uh, it, it has a similar personality to a wild donkey. They were there uh, for protection and other things, and God blessed Hagar and said, your son is going to be like a wild donkey. So you have Ishmael, and then you have the hero of the story. And he's actually the hero of every story. You, you read these accounts, you, you're like, it was, is Abram the hero? No. Is Sarah the, he, the hero here? No. Is Hagar the hero here? No. Is Ishmael the hero here? No. Who's the hero? God. God's always the hero. 
He made a covenant with, with Abram. He said that you are going to have a son, that you're going to be a father of great nations. God, through Jesus Christ, pursues Hagar. He speaks to her. The only time that we see in the Old Testament God speaking to a female, she is scared, she is outcast, she is rejected, and God sees her. And here's the encouraging thing for us today. If you feel all alone, if you feel unseen, if you're in a crisis like Sarah, God sees you and God pursues you and God loves you. And so we see that Hagar is blessed though she's not saved and we see that up to this day that there are people that God blesses but they're not his children. And the blessings that God gives them are limited to this earth, not for eternity like the blessings that we have as followers of Jesus Christ. So let's take a second and just kind of historically with everything that's going on, because I think this gives us a, a really good understanding up to modern day of what's happening in the Middle East. A lot of it started right here. So Abraham has several people groups descended from him. Uh, today, there are almost 16 million Jews who descend from Abraham through Isaac. Now, that's not a very significant number when you think about the billions of people around the world. There's almost 16 million Jews. Remember, 6 million Jews died in the Holocaust. So that's 6 million people who have not procreated and haven't had kids. The Jewish people have always been small in population, but significant in influence around the world. So you have the Jewish people descended from Abraham. You have 436 million Arabs today descended through Ishmael. So you have the Jewish people, you have the Arabs. They are historically cousins. And there has been a family feud that has been happening for over 4,000 years. These religions also were traced back to Abram 4,000 plus years ago. Two cults. The Mormons, 16 million, 8 million Jehovah's Witness. So those are non-Christian religious sects that claim to be Christian, but they're not. They're cults. Muslim Jehovah's, I mean, uh, Jehovah's Witness uh, and the Mormons. You also have 2.4 billion Christians, 1.9 billion Muslims, 2 million Orthodox Jews. Now understand, there are Christian Arabs, and there are Christian Jews, but the majority of the Jews are either secular or orthodox, non-Christian, and the majority of Arabs are Islamic, Muslim. So all Arabs aren't Muslim. Some Arabs are Christian. All Jews aren't Christians. Most are secular or orthodox. So, so you have these three huge people groups and religions that trace their heritage back to Abram. Now, Islam is dominant in the Arab world. Uh, Muhammad, the prophet Muhammad, was born in 570 AD. So you're talking about over 2,000 years after Abram and 570 years after the death of Christ, his vision for Islam happened in 610 AD. So 610 years after Jesus, he had this vision of Islam. In Islam, Ishmael, not Isaac, Ishmael is the hero in the Quran. Uh, Hagar is the favored wife in the Quran, not Sarah. Sarah was the favored wife who had Isaac, who had Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel. Ultimately, Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, came through that line. Ishmael in the Quran is the son of the promise. In, in, the, in the Quran, God asked Abram to sacrifice Ishmael, not Isaac. There's a rewriting of history where Arabs are the favored people, the favored line, instead of Isaac and his descendants. Uh, Muhammad said that Ishmael was believed to have settled in Mecca. So if you wonder today, why is Mecca such a significant city in Islam? Because that's where uh, Ishmael settled. And so what you have is a family feud 
that is 4,000 years old. And so what happens in our biblical illiteracy and ignorance about the past, we look at modern day conflicts and we just say, why can't we just all get along? This goes back 4,000 years. Now here's, here's the significant point I want us to understand when we think about that. Our disobedience never just affects us. Like Sarah is not thinking, hey, you take Hagar, you have a child, problem solved. She's not thinking, hey, you know what? Over 4,000 years from now, they're still gonna be fighting against each other. Like so much of our geopolitical conflict that we deal with today traces right back to these moments. So, so to think about our disobedience, it never just affects us. Your sin never just affects you. Even the sin that you think is only happening in your mind, it affects other people. Secondly, our disobedience can't thwart God's plans. Sarah messed up. She caused Abram to do something that was disobedient towards God's plan, that was not part of God's word. You would have thought it messed everything up, but ultimately, because God is sovereign, even when we're disobedient, even when we sin, it never thwarts God's plans. That is an amen. That's a huge, huge thing. So the point of Abram is not religions. It's not all the people groups. The point of, of Abraham is not it is not religions, but it's redemption. The promise ultimately of Abraham is Jesus. Jesus from the line of Abraham. Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And because of Jesus, we are spiritually in the line of Abraham. When, when God came to Abram in a vision and said, look up at the stars, there are too many to count. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, one of those stars has your name on it. We're part of the fulfillment of that vision. Part of the fulfillment of the promise, redemption, Jesus came from the line of Abraham. So again, the, the hero of the story is not Abraham or Sarah or Hagar or Ishmael, but God who intervenes, the God who sees when we are faithless, when we are disobedient, God is still faithful. Amen. So if you're struggling, if you're walking through a crisis, if you've had a bad week or a bad year, or maybe in your mind a bad life, we have a God who intervenes. We have a God who sees. He sees you right now exactly where you are, exactly what you're dealing with, exactly what you're going through, and God, just like Jesus Christ pursued Hagar, is pursuing you. For some of you here this morning, maybe there's never been a time that you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Maybe you've seen yourself as a victim. Maybe you're just in the midst of a crisis and it's hard to see any other way out. You have a God who sees, a God who loves, a God who has a plan and a purpose for your life. And he proved that and that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, died on the cross in our place for our sins was buried and rose again, showing how much he loved us because God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And it's good. And he wants to show you that purpose today. He wants to reveal himself to you today. So if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, we invite you to do that today. In just a little bit, we're gonna have a, a time of response. The band's gonna come out. And we're gonna have some people down front to my right and to my left. And they're just here to take God's word and share with you how you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you've never trusted Jesus, we want to invite you to do that. Or maybe you're here and, and you've had a faith crisis, you've had a crisis of belief, and maybe there's been something you've done, you've taken God's plan in your own hands, you've got outside of his timing, and maybe some things have messed up. You still have a God who sees, you have a God who's faithful, you have a God who wants to restore and redeem and forgive. And so we wanna invite you to come to Jesus this morning to trust him, to put our faith in him, the God who sees, the God who 
saves. So I wanna pray for us right now. Father, we thank you for this truth. We thank you for, God, this story, this account of a bad day where, where Sarah and, and Abram are struggling. They're struggling in their faithfulness. They're struggling in their belief. And they make some poor decisions that, that had a lot of negative repercussions, not only on their family, but the world. But Father, I thank, that you, I thank you that you're faithful, that you're sovereign, that you're good, that your plans are never thwarted, that you're the hero of the story, that God, it's not about what we do, it's about what you did. So God, if our life is messed up, if our marriage is messed up, if our family is messed up, God, you're the hero. You're the one who wants to step in, who wants to intervene, who wants to show us yourself. And, and God, you wanna bring the healing, the fix, the victory to our situation. So Father, again, if there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. God, that we would trust you. Lord, we thank you today that you are the God who sees us. We love you. Thank you for first loving us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today for our online worship service. God is doing so many things at Mission City Church that we would love for you to be a part of. Just go to missioncity.church to learn more. I also want to encourage you to worship today through giving. Click the Give button at the top of your screen and you can be a part of our mission in that way as we continue to see God transform lives here in San Antonio and online. We'll see you next week.